peer-to-peer -peer world without hierarchies, global unmediated connectivity, equal democratic participation across differences. Claims of revolutionary potential have surrounded internet technologies from the very early on, while blockchain technology being the most recent example. The emerging hypes around NFTs in and beyond the art world and the potential of DAOs as an alternative way to organize and govern communities and their resources are adding new fuel to the fire, raising hopes for more inclusive markets and self-determination. People engaging in blockchain often express a desire for a different world. Yet the social dynamics that mainstream blockchain projects produce usually remain firmly rooted in a status quo that idolizes private ownership and rewards early adopters. Are alternatives possible? What besides ownership is being desired in blockchain experiments? Can blockchains break free from capitalist logics or does the tokenization inherent in their systems prevent any potential in this direction? In this session, we will take a closer look at the desires encoded in blockchain, DAO, and NFT projects and explore what a vision of a truly different world with blockchain could look like. And we're very happy to be joined by Felix Stadler, professor teaching digital culture at the Zurich University of the Arts. His work focuses on new modes of commons-based production, copyright, datafication, surveillance, and transformation of subjectivity in nature. He also works as a cultural producer. He's a moderator of the mailing list NetTime and a member of the World Information Institute and the Technopolitics Working Group. He's the author slash editor of numerous books, including Kultur der Digitalität, Digital Condition, Aesthetics of the Commons, and Digital Unconscious. Martin Zeilinger is a media theory and digital art researcher, as well as curator, based in Dundee, Scotland, where he serves as senior lecturer in computational arts and technology at Abertay University. Martin is a longtime Money Lab collaborator and was lead organizer for Money Lab 4 in London in 2018. His critical writings have appeared in books such as Money Lab Reader, Volume 2, Artists Rethinking the Blockchain, and Chimera's Inventory of Synthetic Cognition. In 2021, he published his first book, available through open access, titled Tactical Entanglements, AI Art, Creative Agency, and the Limits of Intellectual Property. And the third speaker we invited for this second panel, Jaya Clara Brecke, uh, will unfortunately not be able to join us uh, tonight, but she is in our thoughts, and we do hope that we can yet channel some of her perspectives and contributions in the discussion. And finally, I would like to introduce the moderator of the panel, Inte Glorich, a PhD researcher at Utrecht University and the Institute of Network Cultures. In her PhD, she explores socio-technical imaginaries around blockchain technology as they appear in, for instance, blockchain memes, startup culture, and art. She co-edited Money Lab Reader 2, Overcoming the Hype, and State Machines, Reflections and Actions at the Edge of Digital Citizenship, and also organized several conferences on these topics. She teaches at the Master's Program, New Media and Digital Culture, and the bachelor's program, Media and Information, at the University of Amsterdam. Inta, the floor is yours.
Oui. Um, thank you. Um, so, um, oh, maybe I go to the next slide? Oh, there it is. Um, when I was asked to moderate this panel, I was basically given these two words, ownership and desire, um, and um, yeah, asked to um, think about that and, and uh, um, also in collaboration with the speakers, kind of define this, uh, this theme. Um, and uh, they, they are very big words. And um, I kind of want to take a moment to explore um, what they could mean. Um, di desire for what? Ownership for what? Um, so, yeah, I think there is um, a lot to say about these words in the blockchain space, and I'm going to kind of trace a few examples. Um, so the first question I had actually was, shouldn't the title be Desire for Ownership? Um, so with so much volatility uh, in speculation in the crypto market um, and uh, collectibles that at least until a, um, a bit ago uh, were like kind of a required asset for the rich and famous. Um, and we've heard about the tokenization of uh, pieces of actual land in the Amazon. Uh, there's a lot of um, sort of desire for ownership in the blockchain space. Um, but another way of looking at it could also be um, that ownership and desires are kind of uh, sort of exclude each other. Um, you desire something um, that you don't own. Uh, once you own it, you don't desire it anymore. Um, and desire is about change. It's moving on from the status quo, shaking things up. Um, redistributing them. Uh, desire has potential. Uh, it's not yet. Um, it's inspiring and it draws you in and it's in expressed in visions and dreams about possible futures. Um, and ownership, on the other hand, uh, is the situation as it is. Uh, it's a logbook that shows that I own this and you own that. Um, uh, and we're told that uh, we should sort of protect the things that we own and uh, actually grow the things that we own, make more of it. Um, but at the same time, to say that ownership is conservative and desire is progressive is, not, is too easy. Uh, desire can be extractivist and uh, exclusionary as well. Um, so what is the object of desire or ownership? Uh, is it something material like economic value, cryptocurrencies, shared funds in a DAO? Um, or perhaps uh, should I interpret it um, more as a sort of on an abstract level? Uh, the desire for freedom or autonomy, self-sovereignty, those kind of things. Um, another way of looking at it would be um, to look at the technology itself, owning the infrastructure. Um, that's certainly also something that people are interested in in the blockchain space. So, lots of questions. Um, and I think the blockchain culture, um, there, it's not a homogenous block of desire, basically. Uh, there are many different groups pulling at the te uh, technology in different directions. Um, so, for example, Bitcoiners uh, often describe blockchain as a way to organize global transactions without authorities. Uh, using open source technology in a peer-to-peer -peer way. Um, you can, maybe it's the desire for owning the financial infrastructure so that it can be freed from politics, sort of infrastructure of the people. That's their dream. Um, but also over the last uh, decade, Bitcoin has burst out of this initial niche uh, and the desire, um, this desire got sort of competition uh, from other communities inter interacting with the technology as well. And one that I think um, we hear about a lot is um, uh, day traders that sort of make uh, Bitcoin a speculative object, um, looking for patterns to predict what the future is going to do, creating narratives of causation and correlation. And their desire is no longer to own the financial infrastructure, um, but to squeeze as much material value as it, out, uh, out of it as they can. Um, and I did some research on blockchain memes and I tried to work them into any presentation that I have. So this was my opportunity. Um, 
So while the Bitcoin maximalists hodl their coins waiting for the infrastructure to uh, become dominant, um, day traders are just riding the waves, um, the waves of the volatility pretty much agnostic to uh, the infrastructure beneath it. Um, but I don't think it's useful to dwell too much on Bitcoin uh, today because I suspect a lot of our conversations are going to be more about NFTs and DAOs as the previous panel also showed. Um, so, but I do think that this example sort of highlights fundamental questions like what is owned and who does that owning? Um, so money has always functioned as um, as always functions because we agree um, collectively that these coins or bills or numbers on our screens uh, have value. It's a story that continues to this day and it's also beneath cryptocurrencies. Um, what, is, what is owned is something that has value because enough people believe it has value. Um, and NFTs bring another layer to this uh, story. They problematize the idea of ownership further. Um, it has often been made clear that while we talk about um, selling artworks or images, what is really owned is a sort of pointer to those artworks or images. Um, so yet NFTs have a real effect on how we relate uh, to the digital world and the potential that people see in it. So do NFT NFTs frame the world as uh, tradable distinct objects or are there also other options? Um, and the second part of the question, who is involved in this owning? Um, could be from anonymous wallets, to trading bots, to influential co collectors, individuals or communities connected uh, through multi-sig accounts or DAO voting uh, procedures, humans or non-humans. Um, so how do NFTs relate to our more than human and entangled world? The other questions would be, what is desired and wh who does the desiring? Uh, we can ask these similar questions of desire. What exactly is desired? Uh, blockchain desires come in all shapes and sizes, from the most libertarian and megalo me megalomaniac uh, to grassroots and activist blockchain communities that are, for example, trying to encode uh, feminist um, ways of valuing things in their DAOs. Um, so what, can, what, can, what is desired can be as material um, as like economic wealth uh, or as abstract as equality. Um, but desire is something that I feel like often it's, it's sort of operational, it's goal-oriented. Uh, it's something that um, is available for capture in a sort of capitalist narratives of progress. Instead of desire, maybe, uh, we could use a word like wonder uh, in the context of blockchain. What, um, what, what kind of pull on the future does wonder have? To wonder with the technology, about the technology, um, what if things could be different? Uh, usually the part of a DAO that I get most excited about um, is the development phase, when it is not yet. Um, when discussions about governance are made explicit and are able to be negotiated before the smart contracts start running uh, and if-then statements are locked down. So the becoming DAO. The DAO that is never formalized but always in a state of becoming. I wonder what it could be. Uh, what does consensus really consist of? Uh, or how could minority voices um, be made to weigh heavy instead of the majority? Uh, what exactly is the most equal way to distribute funds? Do we actually agree on that? Um, I wonder what kind of different models are possible. Uh, and this is the moment I'm most convinced of blockchain's potential in its bringing up for, for discussion the things that we tend to overlook uh, in the structure of our everyday life. Exactly those things that carry uh, the weight of years and centuries uh, of power imbalances. Uh, but seem to be natural facts of life. So perhaps my desire for blockchains is always to remain becoming. Thanks.
Okay, um, I have to move, so otherwise I can't see. Um, thank you, Inter, for um, framing the panel in a really useful way. Um, I want to talk about something that I still haven't fully thought through, and I hope the discussion with all of you afterwards will contribute to clarifying this further. Yesterday, a large crypto exchange, uh, FTX, collapsed after it was discovered that its investment division had used a self-created currency created you know, out of thin air as a collateral to borrow real money for speculation. And now, eight billion are missing. Oops, sorry. If we scroll down the website, Web3, Web3 is going great. We get the impression that crypto in all its manifestations is fraught with a, with a few basic schemes, Ponzi schemes, rock, pull, rock pulls, wash trade, endlessly varied. On this level of generality, it's probably the most correct things we can say. But this level of generality is often not particularly interesting. I want to go a bit deeper because there is a lot more animating the cryptosphere and the commons than simple, rational, if often criminal, calculations. Indeed, running underneath and through these get-rich-quick schemes are strong currents of desire. And these desires are, perhaps surprisingly, quite similar, at least on some level, to those that have been animating many commons projects over the last 25 years. This is the desire for freedom, or more precisely, a desire to flee what is seen as fundamentally unfair, oppressive social institutions. Or even more precisely, a desire to overcome alienation and live an authentic life. That we actually don't know what it means to live an authentic life is precisely why so many different ideas and practices can be infused with that desire. Authenticity and overcoming alienation is perhaps the most powerful and long-running desire animating digital culture. And there are two versions of that desire that found, that found their way into digital culture by way of the American counterculture of the 1960s. One is a communitarian version of this desire and one is a libertarian version of this desire. But of course, this prototypical modern desire for authenticity didn't originate in the American counterculture. So it's worth to go back a little further to the late 18th and early 19th century. As a direct, relation, a direct reaction to the Enlightenment, Romanticism as a counter movement emerged. It offered a critique of reason and a critique of rationality focusing on what would later be called the instrumentality of reason, which they saw as draining the world of meaning and turning everything into a means. What was offered instead is what, one, what I would call a worship of mystery, of something that is beyond the reach of that kind of calculating instrumentality. And also there, from the beginning, there were two versions of this mystery. One was the mystery of a higher power, and one was the mystery of communion. Now, these two mysteries have a lot of things in common, so it's easy, you know, historically for movements to flip from one to the other. Um, but it's worth keeping them apart for the moment. The mystery of the higher power was, of course, initially the mystery of religion and its institutions, most importantly, the Roman Catholic Church. It claimed to represent a power beyond reason, a power beyond instrumentality. And the mode of accessing this power was submission. Over time, the form of this higher power morphed a few times. It could be the charismatic leader, 
and emanating from the Austrian School of Economics, particularly from Hayek, the market was seen as this mystery. The market's functioning, it was claimed, was beyond human comprehension. And for mere mortals to intervene in this functioning was the road to serfdom, as he famously put it. Its main feature, a hand, was to complete the famous cryptic image of Adam Smith, invisible, much like the hand of God, at least the one that does not belong to Diego Maradona. The mode of authentic living is to accept and submit to this unquestionable absolute power and seek the most direct connection to it, either by removing intermediaries or accepting only traditional forms of intermediation. Once this submission has taken place, one enters a community of true believers. And within this community, there is equality in submission. At the end of times, the chosen community will survive, or if everyone joins the community here and now, and it's a unique form of mystery worship, paradise on earth will be realized. In market terms, removing intermediaries is called deregulation. Let the market work its magic. The second mystery that the romantics offered was the mystery of communion, of experiencing direct relationships with someone or something else that is not mediated through reason, language, or other forms of cultural framing. Initially, this communion was with nature, as the force that had been untouched by, industrial, by the Industrial Revolution and the instrumental calculations that came with it. There was also a strong spiritual dimension to this, but it was fundamentally a horizontal one. The experience of interconnection with the non-human, as we would say today. A way of accessing these mysteries was to open up, to overcome the crippling of the senses created by the enlightenment and rationality. Like the mystery of authority, the mystery of communion also shifted its shape over time. It could be nature, it could, but it could also be the human community without hierarchy and without rules. Part of this desire was the belief that all forms of oppression, of inauthenticity, alienation, if they could be removed, things would naturally return themselves into a balance, into a state of harmony. You've probably guessed it. Uh, this desire animate both the commons and the crypto movement. For the commons, code is law, and one has to submit to that in order to become free and enter a community of believers that are all essentially equal before this higher power of computation. This element of submission to power, I think, goes a long way to explaining the affinity of large parts of the crypto movement to the far right. The belief of returning or recreating a state of a natural state of harmony is surprisingly strong in the commons movement, perhaps less in the digital commons movement, but certainly where its ideas of nature overlap with the esoteric. I think this desire to overcome alienation and create authenticity is fundamentally problematic. I think the alternative to that is to embrace our fall from grace, to understand that in order to remake the world, we have to enter into conflictuous relationships, um, give ourselves rules that enable and constrain ourselves and embrace the complexities that come with the ambiguity of existence. Indeed, the most successful commoning projects have all done that and have been arguing over their rules how to in, and how to inter interpret them and how to adapt them ever since. Nobody would describe, for example, Wikipedia as a harmonious community. But at least so far, it has managed to handle its conflict in a self-organized and productive manner. There's also the example of the large free software community Debian with its social contract 
and all the, the mediation and um, conflicts that come around that. Um, there's a lot of governance structures built on this basic uh, principle of, of values that are very explicit and under constant kind of discussion. I think um, Jaromil could tell us a lot about kind of the conflicts and bickering within this community around this set of rules. And I think this will also, you see it here, um, a great uh, test for uh, the Mastodon community, um, whether they are able to develop and, and implement uh, rules and, and features for moderation that go beyond the, the classic benevolent dictator model. If you are my server, you have to play with my rule. In the same way, the most interesting crypto project, some of them we have heard in the uh, panel before, are not those who want to abstract away social relations into some trustless nirvana of pure and ambiguous transaction, but rather those who use the possibility of coding rules for the interaction as a chance to rethink about these rules and the kind of social trust they might create. I think this is also a bit what Jaromil meant that about the bringing the commons uh, to the crypto movement. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Felix. Um, I, was, I was reminded in your talk of uh, something I came across recently. Um, um, Max Kaiser. Max Kaiser is a sort of uh, TV personality. Uh, he's, he wrote a book about Bitcoin maximalism. He's a maximalist, and he said, "We stand naked before Satoshi." Um, and, yeah. Are you doing questions, or should I? Should no, I, I was filling <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. Um, before I begin, just quickly, thanks to Axioma for the invitation and also for putting together this really extraordinary event. And um, also thanks to my two co-panelists for um, really thought-provoking presentations already. Um, um, so. Um, I want to talk a bit about what I call zones of exclusivity and how they um, manifest as um, structures of belonging. Um, much like Inter, I'm, uh, as inspiration for my own little intervention here, I've taken the um, title for the panel very literally, um, Ownership and Desire. Um, and um, riffing on these terms is really what I'll be doing. Um, and as a starting point for that, uh, I, I use the following question. How is desire for ownership framed on the blockchain? And how is it inspired in the NFT space? And Inte, I think you also had that on one of your slides, desire for ownership. And mm -hmm. I think yeah. somehow I arrived at that same formulation. Yeah. So how is desire for ownership framed on the blockchain? And how is it inspired? in um, what we generally now call the NFT space. There's really just one main argument that, that I want to begin to develop here, and it goes like this. It seems to me that part of what NFT art projects more and more often um, inspire now is not exactly a desire for ownership in the conventional sense of private property, but instead also a desire for belonging, which runs parallel in interesting ways to private property. This desire for belonging manifests in these nested zones of exclusivity. And uh, I want to go a little bit into what I mean uh, by this and how I see that playing out. Many NFT projects use all kinds of um, quite well-known, but also some new gatekeeping mechanisms, uh, which are themselves oftentimes tokenized. And um, these mechanisms are used in order to establish zones of exclusivity that can be either real, for example, in the form of members only, uh, members only access, but they can also be imagined by way of hype or promotional activities. And very often they're, they're a mixture of both. These zones of exclusivity inspire a desire for belonging that doesn't quite replace a desire for ownership, but which I think, as I said, runs parallel to it and which can very easily be used to amplify a desire for ownership. 
There are two important aspects that I want to um, um, draw out here. The first concerns the specific affordances of NFT technologies. Um, and here, what I'm interested in is that these zones of exclusivity are, are quite easy to enforce computationally. For example, again, through tokenization. The second aspect builds on the fact that these zones of exclusivity tend to be established um, and maintained through communication technologies. And so that second aspect relates to the fact that they're almost always um, socially enacted. The etymology of the concept of belonging is useful to, to figure this out a little bit more. The verb to belong indicates a relationship, a certain type of connection between two or more actants. In the Old English root from which the word stems, the verb doesn't originally just denote ownership, but literally it means to go along with or um, to pertain to. So belonging has two connected meanings. If something belongs to me, generally we assume that it is in my property, but in turn I can also belong to something. And generally this means that I'm a member of something, uh, a club or association or some other kind of group. So put simply, Belonging denotes both ownership, being in the property of, and membership, um, being a member of. And in the contemporary um, um, and in the contemporary NFT art space, in the context of how um, art projects are structured, and also in the context of um, the architecture that they design, the user experience that they design, I think it's becoming quite interesting to unpack this duality of meaning of belonging. Ownership and membership are quite similar, but in some ways they're also very, very different. Ownership, of course, generally pertains to property. We buy something, it becomes our property, it belongs to us. Membership is similar in the sense that uh, it is oftentimes initiated by some kind of um, transaction as well, a financial exchange. But the concept of membership, and I think this is what's important here, it also enacts an interesting conceptual reversal or inversion. When you are a member of something, it doesn't belong to you, you belong to it. And that's precisely what many NFT projects now um, seek to inspire, I think. Not just a desire to own, but a desire to belong. The desire to belong to an exclusive club of those with access, those with knowledge, those with the ability to capitalize. The entire rhetoric around early adopters, you know, to the moon type profit forecasting uh, and all of that, it really helps to amplify engagement and adoption um, literally, that's what the fear of missing out is all about. There's also an additional layer here that we could consider, um, that, but I don't think I'll have much time to go into, namely the question of what kind of labor is constituted in this eagerness to participate, this desire to belong, and thereby always to co-generate value. And how is that um, value of that labor then extracted by the platform operators or the pro project initiators? Certainly, I wouldn't be the first to observe that all NFT art collectors are also investors and by extension, co-workers, if you want to put it that way, in the effort of uh, co-creating and increasing value. NFTs are intangible and so is the ownership or the experience of owning uh, NFT-based digital art. And it can be a quite disembodied experience, an experience that's perhaps not particularly rewarding, at least that's how I feel. Um, but what you do often get, get in NFT projects in terms of a rewarding experience is privileged access to zones of exclusivity within which you are meant to have the very satisfying power of co-generating, co-determining the financial value of that which you have bought. So there is a shift, in other words, away from the privileges of private ownership that NFTs can supposedly afford and towards an emphasis on the production and amplification of a desire for belonging underpinning the projects. This can rely on really quite straightforward mechanics that you will all recognize um, and which we can find on many, many NFT art marketplaces and as part of many NFT art projects. Here are just two examples uh, of very prominent structures of belonging in contemporary NFT art. Whitelists, or also called allow lists. Um, an NFT whitelist is commonly a list of crypto wallet addresses that have priority permission to mint project NFTs at initial release prices. In other words, you don't have to go to the secondary market to get it. 
The idea is that those in the know, uh, those with privileged access, uh, early adopters or investors or supporters, will benefit and profit from this access. And if you look around online, you'll find thousands and thousands of NFT projects that use this mechanic. And also hundreds and hundreds of online articles that tell you um, about what you have to do to get on whitelists. The vast majority of these articles highlights, above all else, the social labor, the community engagement that is required to do this. And the two most common elements usually include engaging with the project's social media activities, basically help marketing and promoting, oftentimes following very specific requirements, and engaging with the community on dedicated discussion forums such as Discord, for example, which can entail also, again, kind of very prescribed active co-creative contribution to all kinds of um, infrastructural aspects of a project. Second example, token gating. Th this mechanic works a little bit differently and uh, I use a community called uh, Friends with Benefits as an example. In a way the, the name of this community already really tells you everything you need to know about it uh, uh, in a lot of ways, right? Friends with Benefits. For those of you not familiar with it, um, this, this is a group that um, um, is dedicated to promoting and co-developing and selling blockchain and Web3 enabled content, um, digital art as well, and also some platform infrastructure solutions uh, for doing this kind of stuff. The community is structured entirely around the concept of token gated access, meaning that the ability to observe or join community activities is itself tokenized something that serves both to curate activities within the community and also to curate the membership body. In this system, participation is only possible if a user possesses units of the platform's own social token with different levels of, ex of access available to each user depending on how much they hold. Again, I want to emphasize that both of these structures of belonging are, as I said, computationally enforceable and that they are also both socially enacted. They grow and prosper, they work on the basis of community engagement and information flows and the hype connected to that. And really we find these structures of, uh, these kinds of structures everywhere. Uh, they are copied far and wide um, across the internet by all these crappy new NFT projects um, um, and you'll find them on a lot of NFT art platforms as engagement tools as well. There's a lot more to analyze and discuss here, and uh, maybe we'll pick some, some, some of this up again uh, more in, um, um, in the discussion. So I want to wrap up. Um, it's important to point out here that infrastructures such as friends with benefits can in principle be described as decentralized and horizontal in the sense that participation and access is in theory available to everybody. And indeed, Friends with Benefits actually describes itself as a DAO. The informational material on the website very, very heavily draws on the rhetorical affordances of decentralization, distribution, non-hierarchical organization in order to, to amplify this idea about what kind of structure of belonging this is. It's all about doing things together, about sharing visions, operating as a collective, collaborating, and so forth. The website is full of invocations of, 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 of community spirit. Um, technology is meant to function as a communal connective tissue and so forth. To me this is really a perfect example of a structure of belonging that is instituted and upheld through zones of exclusivity. All of it serving to kind of veil or disguise um, or obfuscate the role that ownership and profit-oriented asset logic still has in the project. It's clear that in this ecology, it's a user's wealth, namely the amount of tokens they hold that determines their power. Token wealth is quite literally a proof of stake verification protocol here, determining the value or the potential value of a user's um, contribution to the community and also a user's power to capitalize on their own ability to participate. So to summarize very, very briefly, um, Maybe the emergence of decentralized, unforgeable digital tokenization systems never really fixed the perceived shortcomings of traditional intellectual property ecologies. Instead, they've introduced something new. They've opened the door for yet another type of enclosure system in the form of um, layered zones of exclusivity. Um, and I'll end on just a few notes and questions maybe. Um, what does it mean that something like Friends with Benefits describes itself as a DAO. What other kinds of structures of belonging can we build? 
ones that could move us more properly beyond the cultural logic of capitalism, perhaps? How does the concept of a structure of belonging map onto various existing and emerging DAOs that we've already heard about today? Maybe ones that have a strong activist and community orientation. Overall, it strikes me that uh, concepts and mechanics that, that I've tried to briefly sketch out here could maybe be useful for reflecting um, on um, the very different kinds of DAOs that we are involved in building or that we are uh, um, envisioning these days. I think our goal definitely needs to be to reverse the trajectory from commons to NFTs. And on the way to achieve this, it might be yeah, helpful to reconceptualize, as I've tried to do here, property enclosures as structures of belonging. Thanks. Thanks, Martin. Um, before we go into my questions, uh, just a reminder um, for the audience also to start thinking of questions you might have. We have one presentation less than uh, was scheduled, so we have time for questions. Uh, also online, um, yeah, please uh, send questions and I, I will see them here. Um, but, um, I wanted to start first, um, basically continuing uh, from the last uh, panel as well, by a question for each of you. Um, and I start, I'll start with Felix. Um, I'm seeing a lot of artworks recently that are um, sort of including this mystical element um, in, in their work on blockchain. Um, I remember uh, in the exhibition Pieces of Me, uh, Mauritian Aliari had a talisman for the possession of an NFT. This was really in the moment when like, the big hype was first sort of starting to come out um, and we needed something to guide our way. Um, but also a book like Radical Friends where there's like tarot cards and those kind of things, uh, like invoking some kind of mysticism. Um, what do you think about this? Um, can we, does this bring us something? Is this useful? Um, what can we learn from that? Or... Um, I think, yeah, perhaps it's useful because it at least, you know, gestures towards an, 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 a language that is not all calculation, that is not all planned, that is not all kind of computationally determined. And that I find um, interesting because it, it, it also gestures towards um, agencies that are beyond our control, that we cannot model, that we cannot predict, that we cannot you know, own in, in, in this sense. Um, I, I think um, by, by saying it gestures into a direction, I hope we can go a bit further. There. I'm not sure how much, in the end, mysticism really helps us to develop this language. And the, I mean, I, I absolutely share this, this kind of traditional romantic critique that says, you know, rationalism uh, closes off certain access to the world. But I think by now we have so uh, many more ways to extend our senses, uh, all these kind of sensing technologies that we understand now, kind of, you know, how the wind operates, how, how uh, you know, plants communicate with one another that we can perhaps develop a better language to point towards that, you know, more than human agency than that of uh, traditional mysticism. I see you nodding. I'm, I would, more than human and entanglement were co uh, concepts that I wanted to bring on. So maybe if you want to add on to this, I'll be very curious. Only if then you also add something to <laughs> it in return. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I appreciate uh, um, the, the way in which those concepts can open up our thinking about these technologies very much as well. Um, um, myself, I've kind of tried to invoke uh, this idea of more, more than human ecologies in the context of talking about AI and AI art uh, a little while ago, but I think it's extremely useful in this blockchain context as well. And um, I think this already came up a little bit this afternoon before, right? That, that um, really um, 
in the way we in the way in which we envision DAOs um, conceptually and idealistically, they are absolutely more than human um, assemblages of very complex hybrid um, you know webs of computational um, protocols and human participants and, and 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 deeply human and emotional forms of communication and idea sharing. Um, and um, yeah, those functions bounce back and forth between uh, computational and 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 human contexts. And um, I don't know if mysticism is is maybe a um, um, a vehicle or um, aesthetic tool to foreground that or amplify that sometimes, or remind even just remind us of the presence or importance of that. Um, but in that sense, I think it has a very great value. All right. Maybe I'll, I'll add that uh, while you were speaking, I was thinking that, well, tokens have a problem of entanglement. Like, thinking in tokens sort of problematizes entanglement or it, it, it kind of hides it, maybe. Um, so I, I think that's something that I would be very curious in, like, for people to explore. How could NFTs be entangled? Um, what, do you, I, what do you mean by that, that, that they have a problem of entanglement? Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, well, I think they, they, they try to um, like atomize and, and um, make very distinct um, pointers to things. Um, and in the process, um, the fact that these things are entangled um, is, is hidden. Did you want to respond to that or not? No. Right. no. I, I see thoughts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, um, kind of the dream of, of uh, kind of a, let's say, a conventional uh, blockchain vision is precisely to abstract all entanglements away and have everything to be totally unambiguously described and therefore endlessly movable around. Well, the moment you acknowledge kind of these entanglements, then, then the thing you are describing changes with the entanglements. And then it's never unambiguous. It's always that or something else. That could be a minor change or, or a major change in, in what, it, what the thing itself is, but it means you can no longer describe it once and for all absolutely um, unambiguously so that it can easily be compu computed from here to kind of eternity. Mm. And um, I think this is a, is, 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 is a fundamentally anti-social way of thinking. It's really problematic on, on a lot of levels. Maybe I, maybe I can also jump in because that, that concept of abstraction is also precisely what came up for me as well in this context. And um, maybe also referring back to some of the presentations of earlier today of green DAOs that are about land use or land access, but then also issues around um, um, uh, the expropriation of indigenous access to, to land, right? And abstraction is fundamentally uh, a concept that is needed for that, where you have to uh, um, abstract um, this um, um, ideal conceptualization of what the land is from from the economic or social and political value it has, and only only once you've abstracted that, you can tokenize it in a way. So, in some contexts, maybe there is actually really also strongly a need to resist tokenization efforts um, and uh, the kind of abstraction that they introduce. Uh, there was another topic that I saw, actually I was planning to steal a question from one of the slides that Martin, you skipped over quite quickly, <laughs> um, because I saw something about the gamification of be belonging, and I was wondering if you could say something about that. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I meant that in the sense that um, the desire to belong to an exclusive community of token holders, for example, or whitelisted uh, people for a project 
um, that um, the, the production of that desire is very oftentimes gamified. Um, so there are, um, you know, they'll, they'll be quite subtle and simple nudges and prompts in your interfacing with the, the system, usually through a website, that produces a desire to know more or have access or be allowed is in a way. Um, 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 I think if I had a bit more time, maybe in that, in, in that, on that slide, I might have talked about um, that Damien Hurst project a little bit, uh, the, the currency that many of you will be familiar with, which was a big uh, NFT project that Damien Hurst, the Damien Hurst Studio uh, produced. And um, uh, if you remember, it was a, what was it, an edition of 10,000 artworks that he produced, and uh, you could buy them for a fixed price. Um, um, but then within a year, you would have to decide whether you want, wanted to keep um, the paper work, the original Damien Hurst, or an NFT version of it. And whichever choice you make, the other one would be destroyed. So, um, and then supposedly that would tell us something about where the actual value of, of art uh, is meant to reside. And anyways, but in the way this um, outcome was meant to be produced, um, that had, a, that had game, game, uh, game aspects to it. Also the way in which you were not precisely invited to buy the pieces, but actually you had to apply to, apl to, buy, to buy one of them and then jump through this vetting process. So there were, there were essentially obstacles and motivations to overcome them built into the system that are, exa that's exactly what gamification in a way is. Uh, and so it's maybe a pretty good example of, of what, what I meant by that, that gamification of how these desires to belong are, or the desires for belonging are uh, produced in that, in that context. Thanks. Um, are there already questions? Yeah, I see a question there. One second, there's a microphone coming. Yeah, um, so we're talking about the ownership and desire and there's been very little said about, or maybe nothing, um, about the royalties and maybe the uh, possibility to split the sale proceeds, which is quite novel and a big innovation that came with the NFTs. So I wonder if you have any opinions on that topic, how the royalty systems is contributing towards the ownership or perhaps how, for example, the uh, possibility to commercialize um, these assets might as well impact the notion of the ownership and desire. Mm -hmm. Was it for a particular person or anyone? Basically for all of you. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I, I would have not chosen to talk about that explicitly because I really tried to, um, um, as, I, as, I, as I said, kind of veer away from property enclosures towards thinking about that as a different kind of structure. Um, but, um, uh, but nevertheless, let's talk about uh, royalties. Um, um, I, I think they're, they're, they're maybe actually really interesting in this context because they, um, it's it's a it's a bit like um, deferral of desire, right? Like I mean, the uh, the royalties will who gets them? Well, the artist gets them, but very often, by definition, the person who gets the royalties isn't actually the owner or current owner um, of the artifact that we're talking about, I suppose. Um, so the novel innovation that you are referring to, the ability to um, encode um, royalty mechanisms and smart contracts so that the sec on the secondary market that could be self-enforcing a behavior of the artworks to ship royalties to artists. Uh, that's absolutely an innovation. Um, 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 I don't know how it re reorganizes a desire for ownership. Um, maybe it, 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 it reorganizes it for artists in the sense that they want to incentivize um, reselling and flipping, yeah? um, which I find a bit sad. Uh, and it, it, it isn't what I think of when I think of my, my own desire to have art or to, to, to buy art. I want to have it and have it on the wall and look at it when I have a coffee in the morning, but not, I don't want to flip it um, for my own profit. Um, but maybe artists might be using that technology or that, that, that feature incentivized to um, 
yeah, again, create the desire to pass it on, right? So that otherwise they wouldn't get royalties, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I find it really, you really have to see how this plays out. And I mean, there are already in conventional copyright um, ideas in, 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 um, in Germany, I think it's uh, the German uh, world, I think it's called Folgerecht. Where, where some of the proceeds of selling an artwork is supposed to go to, to the, um, the original um, creator who still holds a number of unalienable rights to the, uh, to the work in the, in the continental tradition. And um, from all that I know, but I'm not the greatest specialist here, that hasn't really worked out very well. And the same I could imagine that uh, this creates a number of novel ways of um, trying to circumvent that feature of the contract, right? You could easily imagine um, you make the, the price of the, of the asset really low, but the fee of transaction really high. And then, and, and then the, the, the overall amount that is automatically um, given to the artist is comparatively low. So just because you encode it doesn't really mean that you, you, you can socially um, kind of enforce it, but it, it could be. It's just, I, I, it's so new that we haven't really had enough um, of um, experience with it, but I would, Kind of be hesitant to really think that code is law here. But there are just other, a lot of other laws too that are not code. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think I have anything very smart to add to this question. But I, I did see, was someone. Uh, 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 we, we started to self organize. We're really sorry about that. Yes, I'm being very sincere with my sorry. Um, um, my question relates to what we were just talking about, but it, I had it before, yeah, to give it some context. Um, and I want to pose a question if it's not necessary to reintroduce the term Kunst and not just use the word art, because the term art in the English language means something completely, um, a group of many visual depictions, and not just visual, obviously, but it's a group of items that has... Uh, for example, nothing to do mostly with Kunst. And, but it's actually very relevant to look at the differences right there, especially in this context, because the mecha mechanisms of um, NFT art and NFT Kunst are totally different uh, as we interpret them, but also as we work with them. Also, when we now coming back to the royalties, um, there's like, when you do like NFT Kunst, there's no problem with the royalties because that would, n I don't know how that would work because it's not the da big DAO thing, it's just an artist and blah. I don't know, I can't go too much into specifics now, but I just really want to say, um, I don't think the arguments always work so well if we just use the term art because it just includes stuff that's just, you know, it's a visual, but it's not what we mean by Kunst, and I think that's a very uh, relevant distinction. I, I think Domenico on the next panel will have a lot to say about mm -hmm. this as well, but I'll leave it to the German mm -hmm. uh, speakers. Too. Yeah, maybe I can just add very briefly, because I totally agree, and, and I think the difference you point to, that is art in this, in this narrow sense of, of Kunst, or, the, or, or art with a capital A, let's say, or, or something like this, is a much more um, it's a much denser social system in which these kind of circumventions are perhaps not so appreciated. Well, when we talk about crypto art, we have all kinds of collectibles, bored apes and, and all of that, where this, this, this kind of density of, of social relations that kind of enforces uh, certain values and behaviors is simply not there. But perhaps that's not what you meant. I see you uh, shaking your head. No, my point was uh, specifically not using the term NFT art in that way because I think it dilutes 
uh, the analysis of how the systems work. Because there is a big issue, you know, with, uh, you know, sexism, racism, anything right-wing drama, you know, in the NFT art world, if you use that term. But there isn't that issue, for example, in the NFT Kunst. I'm just using that term now for, you know, for the sake of it. And so, and also, like, the, the whole, like, the dynamics are totally different and so on. But I think if you use NFT art, we, on my, our heads, relate to art as a non-FT art, and I think that really um, makes the wrong associations and connections. That's what I'm kind of getting to. Okay. Yeah, there is another question. Very, very different uh, question. I, the entanglement uh, thought really struck me, like how through tokenizing everything, we just objectify things and separate, further separate everything from everything else. So my, my question, which is just this, uh, I don't know, airy question, <laughs> could we uh, use NFTs to point to relationship qualitative aspects of a community, for example? So like, not tokenize values, but sort of make it more of, instead of uh, exclusive uh, zones, zones of exclusivity, maybe like uh, qualitative aspects of inclusivity somehow tokenized, just leaving it there. I'm not sure if there's an answer for that, but thank you. Um, the only thing that immediately comes to my mind is the project that uh, Su Tsung uh, talked about before uh, in the previous panel um, about thinking you know, of ways of owning the sea through uh, a very large number of very, very small um, contracts which are all so small that you don't really get any value from the exclusivity that um, this one milliliter of, uh, of ocean water really gives you, but a sense of a kind of a, a shared responsibility, I guess. I mean, at least that's, you know, I don't really have to explain your project, but this is what comes to mind, so maybe you, you can explain this later directly. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, maybe I can add a, a, an example that comes to mind for me. There's a, a, a project that was shown at uh, Documenta this year by a Palestinian group called uh, The Question of Funding. That's the name of the group. And the uh, name of the project was um, a, an Arabic word, uh, daira, which kind of means circular or circle um, or circularity. Um, and, and so um, what struck me about that project is that it doesn't describe itself explicitly as a DAO, but it's a blockchain-enabled um, 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 community project. And explicitly, the aim is to um, establish or support um, um, the circulation of values in the absence of money. So, so the fact that this is not about um, finance or um, financing or crowdfunding um, explicitly um, partly as a, as, as a necessity, I guess, based on the circumstances out of which it grows. So, so a lot of very interesting thinking and discussion went in that project went into thinking about you know, what other kind of value propositions can we work with instead. Um, and and if, we, if we produce a different value proposition, maybe it's expertise or affect or um, time or whatever the case might be, these resources, can they, can they be tokenized? Is, is there a value to be added by tokenizing them? Or, um, or are we actually um, constraining the, the potential that this group might have if we insist on tokenizing these values? Um, so I don't know if that's a very good answer to your question, but I think it, it adds maybe complexity to what, uh, already a very complex, uh, really great question, yeah. I mean, that, that also sort of points to the longer history of like time banking basically is, is trying to do that, right? It's trying to uh, create some kind of uh, exchange value between different peoples like time. Uh, but I was also thinking of like sort of a flip side of this. Um, we were talking in the previous panel about like tokenizing land, Amazon, all these projects. And I've been looking into that a lot as well. And I see a lot of projects that are tokenizing land. And I came across two that were doing that with the ocean. So, I mean, the ocean, like you were saying, like it is just in, like it's so blatantly entangled <laughs> that it is sort of you, sh you see the different the difficulty that people have like between 
uh, what blockchain can do and what like how nature works basically um, yeah <coughs> more questions there yeah so first a uh, short comment on the entanglement atomization and tokens and, uh, words and concepts can also be seen as atomizations of entanglement um, but that's a kind of worms and not to open that more. But I wanted to first thank Martin for um, a great distillation of concepts in the exclusion belonging. Uh, and to reflect on it a bit like that, uh, the kind of case like the friends with benefits. I mean, this is the kind of model of a club, like an exclusive club, like, oh, you want to go to that room, pay more, etc., and following that model. But we see this exclusion pattern in itself, like really in any organization. Somebody becomes a graphic designer in a company or even a charity, whatever. They gain a certain exclusion that others cannot enter. Uh, and that kind of points out how this exclusion in itself is, is more of an instrument with very different qualities of how that instrument is to be used. But I would also point out that like it still traces to your dia duality of the exclusion and belonging like very much the organization any organization the exclu exclusion in it that generates belonging i this is my working place or this is my organization or this is my politics even this is the organization i belong so i think there is uh, quite a bit of legs in the in the duality you make there yeah, th thanks for that comment. If I can quickly respond to that, maybe I, I, um, 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 there, there are some very great phrases and, and formulations in there and your response that I wish I could uh, recall better now. But um, 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 I think you're absolutely right that there is a lot of, um, there, there's maybe a, large, a big spectrum around the question of how um, this production of a desire for belonging, for example, or, or exclusivity, how can that be used? How, how is that instrumentalized? And um, um, I think it's a very interesting problem to consider when we go about um, envisioning any kind of community. If it's true that any community is by def definition exclusionary to some degree, to, to an outside of itself, then um, um, on some very commonsensical level, I, I probably would be like, yeah, absolutely, of course. That, that's, that's the definition of a community, right? But then I would also immediately begin to ask myself, wait a second, is that, does that also align with my um, ideal of how I would like to define community as something that does have the potential to open itself up towards inclusivity rather than exclusivity? Um, so there is a, a, a real contradiction maybe baked into that that is very important, I think, to keep in mind in when we are going about designing the mechanisms that we will use to establish and maintain uh, our, and curate our, our communities. Yeah, thanks. Um, Maybe there was a response. I, I don't know. I, I, I just want to jump on this thought because it really resonated with me. So we organize these underground festivals without security, without rules, without bracelets. And how the community self-regulates is that simply if you have thing in the kitchen, you go to the kitchen and you do the kitchen things. If you don't have things to do in the kitchen, you feel weird and like, oh fuck, I'm like, what am I doing here? I'm like, <laughs> I'm, you know, and you go out. And it self-regulates without having to be exclusive bracelet security guard letting you into the VIP zone. So how does, how could that be, that sort of very human qualitative self-regulative aspect codified in a sense? Yeah. And I think very often, right, like the uh, one approach is to say, well, we can, uh, that, 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 that creates a lot of relationships of vulnerability and contingency and insecurity. So how about we design a trustless uh, implementation of, of those structures, right? So that we don't, so that we don't have to worry about the, the wrong person hanging out in the kitchen for too long. Um, and, but then again, this produces immediately a very interesting contradiction and, 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 and problematic that is difficult to overcome, but very important to keep in mind always, I think, yeah. Um, can I just add very briefly something? I 
think it's really problematic to think of inclusion as good and exclusion as bad in this really binary way. I can imagine a lot of situations where you actually want to exclude. Um, this, this desire for inclusion, you know, has a lot of roots, but one of them is really kind of global markets having access to everything and making everything transparent, making everything accessible, making everything tradable. And against that, I think there are very, very um, valuable and justified uh, attempts to exclude, to say, these set of resources, these set of decision makings are for a limited group only. And I think that the difficulty is to really understand what inclusion and exclusion and, you know, who is included and who is excluded produces in a particular moment. And I can really see a lot of benefit in exclusion. So a question over there and then, um, uh, I don't know, where's no, the mic? Very good. Ah, you had it already. <laughs> hey, uh, actually, I'm not really sure how to point this out. Do you hear me well? Yeah. So, uh, I'm kind of struggling. Uh, maybe I would like just ask you, but then if you, any of you uh, would like to point anything out, to, no problem. But you're talking about ownership, desire, power, control, freedom, you know, these big topics. And at the same time, you know, we are talking about something that lives in the code. Yeah, so it's not on our level. It's somewhere else. It's very, very abstract in itself. And first of all, then let's just go from the basics. Ownership, yeah? Do we own ourselves? Do we own our way of thinking? Like, do we own public opinion? Who shapes it? Yeah. Do we like even desire to own ourselves? Do we desire everything else that's less important? And we are talking about, you know, comments to NFT that's not our idea in itself, maybe. Uh, just guessing. Like, but. Uh, like Hearst, let's say, um, as far as I'm concerned, and as much as I understand uh, our theory, he's actually self-proclaimed to not be a true, uh, let's say, maybe artist, to not be true, like, to actually go against the establishment, but to actually just play it along, you know, to just actually tokenize, to actually, you know, gain the publicity and actually earn a lot of money through art. At least, you know, it's called nowadays as art. I wouldn't call it art. Uh, maybe, like, going back to that somehow, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like, uh, you know, if we understand propaganda and nowadays, like, with all the knowledge, uh, neuro, you know, scientists have and all this, like, how the data of all of us in this room is actually shared without us knowing. So, like, ownership, you know, desire. Do we desire the right things? Do we act in those ways, you know? Uh, like, you know, any advertising is good advertising. So, are we advertising our ideas or someone else's ideas? And yeah, maybe I would just kind of stop here. But yeah, freedom, yeah? Is, is, <laughs> this, is this the way to freedom? I, I think, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, thanks for raising it to an even higher level. This, oh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. I, I'm not used <laughs> to this like, uh, at all. I didn't hear. I'll, I'll, I'll take it as a comment more as a question, but I think it inspires some thoughts for, for me and I'm sure for, for you guys as well. Um, um, yeah, I don't know if if, uh, if 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 that is a question we want to consider: uh, self ownership, uh, self determination, freedom to make those claims. Even um, um, 
I don't really know where to go from, from there, maybe back to tokenization. Can we tokenize those uh, ownership claims? Uh, I hope not, um, but... Maybe not the claim, but in some ways, our data... Uh-huh, yeah. Sure, I mean, the cookie trails I leave behind when I'm browsing the internet are a tokenized uh, truth and property about my identity in, in, in a lot of ways. So you're right, and that is not something I have access to controlling very much, right? So, so that circulates already and is um, 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 expropriated from my sphere of control. Um, um, yeah, a, a bit of a dark thought. I don't know. Maybe you can take it in a different direction. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me perhaps start with the question whether we do own ourselves. If we live in a liberal kind of legal framework, the answer is yes, unambiguously. And because we own ourselves, we can sell ourselves, which is called wage labor. Right? So this is very clear. Whether we, on a metaphysical level, own ourselves, whether we, our thinking is our own, I would say no. But, but for practical reasons... But, if, if you're... Yeah. No, no, I mean, this, you know, legally speaking, you own yourself and you can sell yourself. And we do that quite a lot. Yeah, but I mean, like this governs a, a reasonable degree of our lives. And um, this is basically the, the root of, of kind of a, a liberal legal framework and liberal idea of ownership. You own yourself. Therefore, if you apply your own resources, speaking your own work to the fruits of nature, which are given to us, then you own those results. And then you can sell those results and keep those results and, 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 and all of that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at can, this. Maybe, I'll, maybe I can also put a bit of a different spin on this because I, I personally like to really think of this concept of self-ownership in relation to um, blockchain-enabled digital art objects. And um, at least as a thought experiment, I think it's very interesting to consider how we might design uh, NFT-based, perhaps, um, smart contract-enabled artwork that is um, self-owning, or that might be self-owning to a really quite considerable degree. And then what might that mean? Um, I find that an interesting thought experiment because to me it suggests that um, it, uh, you know, it, it becomes dissociated from a creator who can no longer have authorship claims over it, if the, or, or ownership claims if the artwork is self-owning. Um, and it also might have really interesting implications for the tradability um, or the, 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 the existence of that art object as a commodity. Um, so I think that's an excellent use of blockchain technology to design self-owning artworks that can refuse to participate in the kind of property-oriented circuits of the art market. And there are some projects that, that do this already. I mean, I think this has raised a lot in, in recent discussions in this context, but I'm going to raise it again. Sarah Friend's Life Forms is a very simple and amazing um, uh, example of that, right? Like, so it's an NFT project. Um, it's a very simple uh, rule encoded in the smart contracts, uh, which is if you don't give it away within 90 days, it self destructs and disappears from your wallet. Um, and it's a very simple rule, but it enforces. Well, first of all, it, it, it creates kind of a self-governing behavior of the art object. It has the agency to destroy itself. But um, also it enforces certain behaviors um, for the audience. They have to um, um, enter into these kind of gift economy relationships. Um, and, and very effectively, those NFT tokens resist commodification and resist... Um, everything else that, that we may or may not like about um, um, the NFT art world. Just, what, uh, Just one really response quickly. and then I want to yeah. go to Oz. Thank you. Uh, but I actually believe that I wasn't really understood. I know it was a very... But you know, again, we went to like things like 
wallet? Do you own it? Is it yours? You say it's yours, but is it yours? Do you have it? I said, like, it's an abstract thing. You are saying it's there and it's yours, but are you the owner of that code somewhere? Like that NFT that's then in there somewhere? Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's most, almost certainly not the case, um, but that's also something that we could apply to a lot of other different contexts uh, that are not even digital necessarily, right? Like a lot of um, important, even legal relationships that, that we have are effectively based on a shared um, adherence to a belief that the rules that seem to apply actually do apply. And if we decide otherwise, then, then, then the questions you're asking become very uncertain to answer. Um, then I don't know anymore if I actually have the wallet, if I have the, or even if the, the, the euro bills that are inside my wallet have an actual value, because that's a uh, social contract as well, the agreement that that money bill has, has a certain value that's exchangeable. <laughs> Well, um, sorry, to uh, come back to a practical level to comment on your comment, uh, I just wanted to add that uh, there's already like quite many protocols that are um, uh, working on ways to um, practically exit uh, centralized systems, such as like centralized identity systems, and that NFTs are, uh, in my opinion, like really, really interesting in that uh, level because they enable uh, proper uh, data ownership on a personal level and uh, for instance um, if you're um, working in the DAO sphere and you need to um, approve your skills or your contributions in, in a certain DAO and you want the portability of this information to other DAOs then NFTs uh, come into play in a I think in a real uh, interesting way so that's just what I wanted to say. And actually, you had a question as well, right? Maybe that's the last question we can uh, just, uh, hear from. I'm just going to pour more gasoline on the philosophical side, sorry. <laughs> so if, if we go full on Terence McKenna, then reality is a collective hallucination, right? And uh, the only true desires is shelter, food, and companionship. All the others are just collectively fabricated desires, like it's, it's not real, nothing is real. So how do we fabricate better collective desires so we don't desire the capitalist, you know, very mono, like very uh, object-oriented desires? How do we sort of get out of that framework what we really still use here, all of us, me too? I mean, it's, it's really hard not to think in this. So how do we reframe our desires collectively to represent something of value for more of us than who's here shaping that desire. It, it was also a question that I wrote down in, in like as preparation, but I didn't ask it because I think it's also a bit unanswerable. <laughs> um, but maybe you have ideas? No? Because there, there was another question that I also I also don't think this is. There's a possible one answer to it. And if there is any, it can only be collective, so. Um. Uh, oh, there, there was one, uh, yeah, one last question over there. Maya, so how can I raise a question after clapping? So first I wanted to ask you, like, if you would want to wake up tomorrow and you would need to decide whether we have no comments or we have no NFTs, what you would choose. But rather than asking this, I will ask you the following. If you would wake up tomorrow without owning anything or without desiring anything, what would you choose? Thanks. I mean, the first question is clear. I'd rather have yeah. uh, uh, commerce than NFTs. Um, the ownership question, waking up, no, not, nothing to own versus nothing to desire. It probably depends on the, on the time of the year. <laughs> in summer, I probably take desire, and in winter, I probably take the coat. Can I just have a, have a, a last word? All right. <laughs> so uh, it, it's a really great panel and uh, really great. Uh, uh, question section, Q&A section, 
and uh, I really am happy to uh, have such a beautiful audience here. Uh, but my last word would be, uh, my desire is for you to own me. Thanks. With that, we end this panel. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, and uh, so the next panel starts at uh, 7, and since we are doing this hybrid event, it has to start 7 on the dot, so please be on time. Thanks. Thank you.